welcome to this course on global marketing management and we are talking about the various global market entry modes in module 18 we have seen the target market selection choosing the mode of entry and we have talked about the three modes of entry in this module that is module 19 we will talk about the rest of the modes of entry and we will also discuss uh, the importance of uh, timing of entry in a particular country and the exit strategies if uh, your entry strategy is not uh, correct then you may, then the company may have to exit so therefore we will also be talking about exit strategy so basically we are talking about the various modes of entry one second we will talk about uh, uh, describe them and then talk about some of the more common advantages and disadvantages of those modes of entry so now look at the next mode of entry that is contract manufacturing which is also termed as outsourcing so it is an arrangement with a local firm to manufacture or assemble parts of a product or the entire product but the marketing of this product is the responsibility of this international firm. Now, for example, Hindustani liver, ponds, park tables, etc., are some of the multinationals which employ this uh, contract manufacturing kind of strategy. The benefits are obviously the low cost, the labor cost advantages, saving via taxation, energy cost, and raw material overheads. Then it also uh, has has the advantage of lower political and economic risk, and it gives to quicker access to the markets. But the problem is that the contract manufacturers may become a future competitor. The productivity standards uh, of the contract manufacturer may be lower. There can be backlash from the company's home market employees regarding HR and labor issues and the quality of, of uh, production standards may be poor. Now look at what should be the abilities of an ideal subcontractor. First is he should be flexible, geared towards just in time delivery so that will reduce cost for the company he should be able to meet quality standards as prescribed by the uh, by the company should have a solid financial uh, footings ability to integrate with company's business and they should have contingency plan contingency plans uh, in case uh, things go wrong for example flooding happened in bangladesh and uh, lots of uh, British uh, clothing manufacturers, they, were manuf they, were, they had outsourcing manufacturing of their, their products to Bangladesh. Another type of uh, entry mode is joint ventures, that is the most common uh, form of, uh, uh, of entry. So, any form of association or partnership which implies collaboration for more than a transitory or a small period of time. So, contract manufacturing, outsourcing can be for a small period of time, but joint ventures are for a longer period of time. With a joint venture, the foreign company agrees to share equity or other and other resources with other partners to establish new entity in the host country. So, here, here it is important that they establish a new entity. The partners uh, that they typically look for are, uh, are local companies or the local government authorities other foreign companies or a mix of local and foreign players. So, they come together and establish a new entity. The various forms of partnership on the basis of equity are majority uh, partners that is more than 50 percent ownership, then there can be 50-50 ownership or minority less than 45, 49 percent of ownership. Huge infrastructure of or high tech projects that demand a large amount of expertise and money often involve multiple foreign and local partners. Another distinction is between the cooperative and equity joint ventures. The cooperative joint venture is an agreement for the partners to collaborate, but does not involve any kind of equity investments. For example, one part partner might contribute manufacturing technology, whereas, whereas the other partner may provide access to the distribution channel. And the example is Cisco's sales strategy in Asia. So, what Cisco did was instead of investing in their own sales force, they build a partnership with hardware vendors for example, IBM and consulting firms like KPMG or systems integrators for example, Singapore based Datacraft. These partners in essence act as front people for Cisco. They are the ones that sell and install Cisco routers and switches. Then another, find, another form of joint ventures can be equity joint ventures and it goes a step further. So, in this arrangement partners agree to raise capital in proportion to the equity stake agreed upon. So, it can be less than 50, it can be more than 50, it can be 50-50. The benefits of joint ventures are that it, uh, it gives higher rate of return 
and more control over the operations of uh, the company. Then it uh, leads to creation of synergy, sharing of resources, access to distribution network, contact with local suppliers and the government officials. But, the, uh, but again the problem is that of uh, lack of control over the operations, lack of trust between the partners, conflicts arising over matters such as strategies, resources, allocation, transfer pricing, ownership of critical assets like technologies and brand name. So, lack of trust and mutual conflicts turn numerous international joint ventures into marriage from hell. And in many cases, the seed of trouble exists from the very beginning of the joint ventures. Now, you see that there can be various kind of objectives uh, of, the, uh, of the various partners and the, in this slide, we are talking about conflicting objectives in Chinese joint ventures. So, in planning, the foreign partners, they retain business flexibility while the chi Chinese partners want to maintain congruency between the venture and the state economic plan. Thin contracts, foreign partners wa want unambiguous, detailed and ambiguous and enforceable plans. Uh, contracts while uh, the Chinese wa want ambiguous, brief and adaptable uh, contracts. The what, China, what the foreign, ma ma uh, foreign uh, partners want in technology is to match technological sophistication to the organization and its environment, while the Chinese partners they want to gain access to most advanced technology as quick as possible. So, these are some of the uh, conflicting objectives that are uh, outlined in this slide. Now, look at the example. Auto Latinia, a joint venture set up by Ford Motor Company and Volkswagen AG in Latin America was dissolved after 7 years in spite of the fact that it remained profitable to the very end. Cultural differences between German and American managers were a major factor uh, for that. One participating executive noted that there were good intentions behind Auto Latina's formation, but they never really overcome the Volkswagen Ford and for cultural shock. What are the drivers for a successful international joint ventures? So, the very first and the most important is to pick the right partner and have clear objectives from the beginning and therefore, you also have to if they are coming from uh, if the partners uh, are coming from different countries then they, they need to bridge the cultural gap and to gain top managerial commitment and respect. Use incremental approach and create a launch team during the launch phase, so that uh, the team uh, is able to build and maintain a strategic ali uh, alignment, create a governance system, manage the economic interdependencies and build the organization for the joint ventures. Now, look at the Star Starbucks coffee's criteria in selecting partners. So, the first is the shared value and corporate culture. Then is the strategic between uh, strategic fit between uh, the Starbucks and the overseas partner. Should be a seasoned operator of a small box multi unit retail. Should have sufficient financial and human resources. Involved and committed top management to this joint venture. They, they should have real estate knowledge and access to the real estate. They should be local business leader, have a strong track record in developing new ventures. They have should have experience in managing licensed and premium brands and concepts. They are able to leverage infrastructure and they should have food and beverage experience and this is taken from this website. Another important market entry mo mode are global uh, wholly owned subsidiaries. So, companies with long term and sustainable interest in the foreign market normally establish fully owned manufacturing facilities. So, companies now have their fully owned subsidiaries, those companies who have a long term and a sustainable interest in this foreign market. The factors encouraging the establishment of production facilities in foreign market that they include the trade barriers, difference in the production and other cost and the government policies. Ownership strategies in, in foreign markets can uh, take two routes. One is acquisition that you buy something where the MNCs buy up existing companies and provide quick access to the local market and good way to, to get access to the local brands. Or other can be greenfield operations that are started from scratch and offer the company more flexibility than acquisitions in the area of human resources, suppliers, logistics, plant layout, manufacturing technology and culture. The benefits of a wholly owned subsidiary is that it gives the most control over the operations and thus giving higher profits. 
It also shows a strong commitment to the local market on the part of the company, allow the investor to manage and control marketing, production and sourcing decisions. But the problem is, the problems are, the, there are several risks of full, full ownership. Developing a foreign presence without the support of a third party. Then there is a risk of nationalization, issue of culture and economic sovereignty of the host country. Open hostility towards foreign companies can also complicate acquisition plans. For example, a joint dollar 10.5 billion bid by Cadbury and Nestle to buy Hershey's food and this is the US chocolate manufacturer got derailed in part of a strong opposition from for a foreign takeover from the local community. So, that is why this went, uh, this was not able to uh, get through. So, wholly owned subsidiaries may not be allowed or favored in some countries, particularly in low priority areas. So, obviously, government wa wants, uh, wants more investment in high priority areas as compared to low priority areas and wholly owned subsidiaries means more investments. Moreover, this method demands sufficient financial and managerial resources on part of the company. Therefore, that is, uh, increases the risk. Now, uh, umbrella term for all these kinds of arrangement, entry modes and where you can couple, where, where you can put other, uh, uh, some newer kind of uh, arrangements also are called as strategic alliances. The, so, they can be described as a coalition of two or more organizations to achieve strategically significant goals that are mutually beneficial. So, any kind of arrangement that leads to a coalition of two or more organizations to achieve strategically significant goals which should be mutually beneficial are called as strategic alliances. The principal reason for the increase in cooperative relationships is that firms today no longer have the capacity of a general motor of the 40s which developed all its technology in house. So, they need to have technology, they need to have money, they need to have brands. Therefore, the companies they enter into strategic alliances with each other. As a result firm, especially those operating in technology intensive industries and technology intensive industries mean that it is more capital intensive. Lots of money is required for developing technology. So, the firms may not have all those, all that kind of money. So, in that case, in order to remain at the forefront of all the required critical technologies, these strategic alliances are, are required. The various types of strategic alliances are a simple licensing arrangement between two partners, market based alliances or operations based alliances. So, alliance based on technology swap, simple licensing arrangement. So, they are the most common in high tech industries. Given the sky rocketing cost of new product development, strategic alliances offer a means for the company to pool their resources and learn from one another. Such alliance must be struck from the position of strength. Bargaining chips must be patents that the company holds. Then, then there are several types of marketing based alliances that involves market based assets and resources such as access to the distribution channel and trademarks. The case in point is the partnership, partnership established by Coca Cola and Nestle to market ready to drink coffees and teas under the Nescafe and Nestia brand names. This deal allowed the two partners to combine a well established brand name with the access to a vast proven distribution network. So, Coca Cola had that distribution network while the Nestle had that kind of coffee brand. So, they came together for this uh, winning combination. Then there are certain operations based alliances. They are driven by desire to transfer manufacturing know how. A classic example is the Numi joint venture set up by Toyota and General Motors to swap car manufacturing expertise. The logic behind strategic alliances can be, uh, uh, so, uh, they, uh, it can be categorized into four generic reasons for forming a strategic alliances. The four reasons are the def uh, defense, catch up, remain or restructure and their, their scheme centers around two dimensions. One dimension is the strategic 
importance in the parent's portfolio. So, that is on the y axis and on the x axis we have business market position. So, and in business, uh, business market position can be that of leader and follower while the strategic importance in parent portfolio can be core or peripheral and this gives us four, uh, four strategies. So, a business when the business, business market position is that of a leader and the importance in parent portfolio is core, then you have to, then the company have to defend that. Similarly, when the business market position is that of a follower and it is core to the parent's portfolio, then the company has to do catch up. When the business market position is that of a leader, but the importance in parent's portfolio is peripheral. So, there the company has to remain in this uh, in this situation while when the business market position is that of a follower and the importance is peripheral. So, therefore, they, they need to restructure. So, let us look at this defend in, uh, in, in, in some more detail. So, companies create alliances for their core businesses to defend their leadership position. The underlying goal is to sustain the firm's leadership position by learning new skills, getting access to new markets or developing new technologies or financing other capabilities that help the company to reinforce its competitive advantage. Catch up means that the firms may also shape a strategic alliance to catch up, catch up on what they do not have. This happens when company create an alliance to shore a core business in which they do not have a leadership position. For example, Nestle and General Mills launched serial partners worldwide to attack Kellogg's dominance in the global serial market. So, Kellogg's was, was dominant therefore, Nestle and General Mills they came together to catch up with Kellogg. The third option is to remain, firm might also enter a strategic alliance to simply remain in a business. This might occur for business divisions where the firm has established a leadership position, but which only play a peripheral role in the, in the parent company's portfolio. The alliance enables the companies to get the maximum efficiency of its position. The last strategy is that, of, that to restructure. The firm might also view alliances as a vehicle to restructure a business that is not core and in which they have no leadership positions. The ultimate intent here is that one partner uses the alliance to rejuvenate the business, thereby turning the business unit into a presentable bride, so to speak. Usually, one of the other partners in the alliance ends up acquiring of the business unit. Now, which kind of cross-border alliances succeed? Let us look at an analysis done by McKinsey. So, alliances between strong and weak partners, they seldom work. Building up ties with partners that are weak is a recipe for disaster. So, this alliance is between two equals. The weak partners becomes a drag on the competitiveness of the partnership. Another success factor is autonomy and flexibility. Autonomy might mean that the alliance has its own management team and its own board of directors. This speeds up the decision making process. Being flexible, alliances can more easily adapt to environmental changing changes by revising their objectives the charter of the venture or the other aspects of the alliance. Equal ownership, in a 50-50 ownerships, partner are equally concerned about the other success and partners they also contribute equally to the alliance. All partners will be in a win-win situation when the gains are equally distributed. Other success factors include commitment and support of the top management, strong alliance managers are the key to success. Alliances between partners that are related in terms of products, technology and markets. So, there should be some kind of synergy between partners, have similar cultures, asset size and venturing experience and tend to start on a narrow basis and broaden over time. Now, another important thing that determines the success of a venture is the timing of venture. If the, if the, entry, if the timing of entry is correct then the chances of this uh, venture being successful are higher as compared to the otherwise. So, it is not only important ke which markets you enter and with which kind of entry mode, but also at what time you enter uh, is equally important. 
So, international market entry decisions cover the timing of entry questions. When should the firm enter a foreign market? It, uh, should it be today? Should it be 3 months later or in 2019 or 20? So, numerous factors, new, numerous firm have been burnt badly by entering markets too early. IKEA's first foray in Japan in 1974 was a complete fiasco. The Swedish furniture retailer hastily withdrew from Japan after realizing that Japanese consumers were not yet ready for the concept of self-assembly and preferred high quality over low prices. IKEA re-entered Japan in the late 2005 after more, uh, after more than 30 years, but this time offering assembly service and home delivery. This shows the timeline of Walmart's international expansion. So, it entered into Mexico in, one, uh, in, in November 2001, in Puerto Rico in 1992 and similarly in India that, that was on cash and carry was in August 2007, while in South Korea and Germany they had to, they entered in 1998 and they, ex and they exited in 2006. Note that the gap was almost 30 years between the foundation of Walmart by Sam Walton in 1962 and the retailer's first international operation in Mexico in 1991. So, this uh, uh, it, it was about 30 years that, it, that they took to, uh, to venture into, uh, into international operations. Now, look at the factors that uh, affect the global launch of a new product or service. Launch in the home market, Microsoft launched the Xbox video game console first in its home market, then in Japan and then they came back in uh, to Europe. Launch in a foreign, foreign market, products are not al always pioneered in the company's home market. Volks Volkswagen new Beetle was first rolled out in United States and later on it was rolled out in Germany. So, while Microsoft they launched Xbox first in, uh, in their own country, then they went to Japan and then to Euro Europe, while Volkswagen they launched new Beetle in United States and then in Germany. Toyota luxury car, Marquio, Lexus was launched in July 2005 in Japan, more than 15 years after its 1989 debut in the United States. So, they first went to United States and after 15 years they came back to, uh, to Japan, although Toyota is a Japanese company. So, one is that you have done all kind of things, everything is going, go, go, going well, but maybe just because of bad luck you have to exit. In addition to bad, bad luck there can be a number of other reasons also, but let us assume that every decision was taken correctly and just because of bad luck you are not doing good and therefore you need to exit. So, exit is also equally important as compared to entry because it will determine how and when you may re-enter the same market as you have seen in, in the example given earlier where IKEA re-entered in Japan after the, in 2005 after more than 30 years. So, there can be several reasons for exit. One is sustained losses, currency volatility, premature entry that is the wrong, uh, wrong time to enter. There can be ethical reasons, for example, bribery, the company may not want to give bribes and grease the palm or there can be intense com competition, intense competition it means lower profits and this may lead to not meeting the company's objectives. So, the company objective was to earn 10 percent uh, profits while because of in increased co competition they are earning only 8 percent profits uh, over a sustained period and then resource reallocation. So, company they want to uh, reallocate resources to more to more profitable ventures. Because resources are scarce, so company has to decide where to allocate how much resources. So, obviously, if a venture is not doing well, then they would the company would like to take the resources from there and invest them somewhere else. So, the company the uh, sustained losses means that the company recognize that an immediate payback of their investment is not realistic and are willing to absorb losses for many years, but at the same point 
Some companies have a limit to how long a period of loss that they are willing to tolerate and after that they will like to exit. Volatility, companies offer under, underestimate the risk of the host country economic and political environment. Many multinationals have rushed into emerging markets, lured by prospects of huge population with increasing income and thereby huge markets. Unfortunately, countries with high growth potential often are very volatile. Then another reason was premature entry. So, entering a market too early can be an expensive mistake. Entries can be premature for, for a variety of reasons, reasons such as an underdeveloped marketing infrastructure in terms of distribution and supplies, there can be low buying bar and lack of strong local uh, partners. Often exiting a market is, is the only sensible solution instead of hanging on. There can be ethical reasons, companies that operate in countries such as Myanmar or Cuba with a questionable human rights record often gets a la lot of flack in other markets. The bad publicity engendered by human rights campaigners can tarnish the company's image. Then there can be intense competition. Markets that look appealing on paper usually attract lots of competition. The outcome is often overcapacity that triggers price wars and loss-loss situation for all players. Rather than sustaining losses, the sensible thing to do is to exit the market, especially when rival players have competitive advantages that are difficult to overcome. The next reason can be resource reallocation. A strategic review of foreign operations often leads to a shakeup of the company's country portfolio, spurring the multinationals to reallocate its resources across markets. Poor results from global operations are often a symptom of over expansion. The risk associated with exit are the fixed cost of exit. So, you have invested lots of money and then all those money will go waste. Disposition of assets. So, you may not get the company which want to exit may not get the right uh, valuation for the for their assets. Then it also sends bad, bad signal to other markets that this company is not here to stay and that leads to sac sacrificing of the long term opportunities. The guidelines to overcome all this is to contemplate and assess all options to salvage the situation uh, in the foreign business and do incremental exit and migrate customers. The advantages and disadvantages of different modes of entry are summarized in, the, uh, in this slide. Now, to sum up, companies had a wi wide variety of entry strategy choices to implement their global expansion efforts. So, therefore, the, com the company should evaluate the, the pros and cons of each of those entry, th uh, those mode of entry before deciding on, uh, on which mode to, uh, to adopt. Although it is also possible that the company may be choosing more than one mode of entry in the same country or mode of one mode, one mode of entry across uh, its various, various operations across the world. So, companies often adopt a phased entry strategy. They start off with a minimal risk strategy that is indirect exporting followed by high commitment mode such as wholly owned subsidiaries. So, it is a step by step process first uh, to, to test the markets and then later on, uh, later on they, they go in for wholly owned subsidiaries so that they can have more control over their operations, they can earn more profit, but at the same time uh, the risk also increases. Therefore, it is important that they choose uh, the mode of entry very cautiously. To compete more effectively in the global arena, more and more companies use cross-border strategic, strategic alliances to build up their muscle. So, slowly and steadily they keep on testing the market and then over a period of time they build their muscle through strategic alliances. And these are the two books that uh, has been used for uh, the discussion on global market entry modes. Thank you. Mm -hmm.